uh, thank everybody for showing up here. Um, you guys signed up for a static analysis talk right before lunch. So I appreciate that so much. Uh, you're brave souls. And without further ado, let's get started. Um, right before I click that next slide, my entire slide deck and everything I'm about to talk about is already live. It's hosted at tinysi slash static or tinysi slash shock. So feel free to look ahead, look at the material. I've got some recordings of my demos as well embedded in the talk. So everything that you need. So don't worry about taking screenshots. Let's enjoy the ride. Um, I've already had an awesome introduction. So all I'm going to summarize with that is I code, I teach, I hack. Um, this, this talk comes from a place of me actually being a developer and trying to implement security best practices in production facing systems and in the real world. Um, I am also a red team consultant working with secure ideas. We have been, um, I've only been in the company for three years. Secure ideas has been in the business for 10 years. Uh, we specialize in API and web application, pen testing, and offensive security in general. So that's the brief, and we're just going to hop right in. So the outline of this discussion is going to be TTP, and I know that's not the traditional way that we do it in cybersecurity, but it's a, it's a nice way to encapsulate all the various components of a static analysis engagement. We're going to be focusing in on the tools that we're going to use, then focus on the techniques and the, and the overarching strategy. And then we're going to go about going to talk about the people because it's always been about the people. Um, and I know as engineers, we, get, we might get uh, dissuaded when we we're talking about people. Um, ignoring the human element of security uh, is going to make your efforts futile. So um, this part, the last part is going to be really important. So stay tuned. Now, here's the basic definition of static analysis for the uninitiated. Now, the whole point of what we're going to be going through right here with static analysis is getting as much information we can glean from the source code without executing it, without running it, and without um, doing that sort of dynamic analysis there. So what information can we glean from just examining the structure of the source code itself? In a security context, we're looking for things that compromise the confidentiality, integrity, or the availability of a given system. Now, stack analysis is amazing. I am passionate about it. You can get me running and talking for two hours on this stuff, um, but it isn't perfect. Um, there are some catches and, we'll, and there are catches and pitfalls and we'll go over there. But there are many things that can lie to you. The source code cannot. So this is where the benefits come in. Anything that gives you insight into into the code is static analysis. So some of the tools I'll be talking about here are going to be auditing tools for dependency checking. Will be some linters, traditionally dev only tools, but these tools are actually going to be useful for examining the structure of the code base and give us as analysts, as uh, security, security engineers, as red team offensive security consultants, uh, information that we need to actually help our help the uh, second party help our clients our coworkers and our employers achieve what they want to achieve so the beautiful thing about this day and age the new world order we've got infrastructure as code now and now not only do we have the actual structure of the web application in the code base but we also have things like cloud formation templates. So the cloud infrastructure that the app relies on is now also embedded in the same place right next to the code. It's turtles all the way down. And 
it's all code. It always was, but now we all of that functionality surfaced so we can actually do that analysis. And right before we going to go into it, we're going to do a brief story time. And this is about what we typically go through in a static analysis engagement. So here's what we here's how it normally traditionally goes. Uh, we have a we have security people on call. Maybe the CISO really likes us and brings us in and try to whip the devs into shape. Um, we all commiserate and we go all through like oh uh, as the app app does and we may get maybe the project owner in on the call maybe a senior architect on the call um, and then we discuss about what the app is we get the source code sent in we start the engagement don't get me wrong we do the i'm usually the one assigned to this and we do our best and you and the entire focus of the engagement is about improving the security posture of the client. But at the end of that process, which is usually about a week, we get a, we send our report and for some organizations, it just sits on the shelf and it maybe is useful for that one time, that one and done, but it's not really integrated into the AppSec program itself. And I'm telling you, there is a better way. There is a better way to use static analysis so that revitalizes and defibrillates your apps up program. So your first instinct when you're trying to change the world is to <laughs> try to grab every tool that you can with static analysis um, to cover all your use cases. Hold the phone, wait a second, slow down. Do you even know what, la what language some of your apps are written in? Are you familiar with the tech stack that surrounds it? Answer, those answers to those questions need to drive what tools you reach out for and what tools you get. There are many tools on this list. Um, every one of them was handpicked and selected because one of our clients needed it so for example some one of our clients really trusted veracode they're the better they're um, an industry leader in form static analysis but it can get pretty pricey to scan it um so there are some people with there's some clients with the budget that can handle it and want to get that analysis done that way um, for other clients, we were just looking for, okay, what can you give us with open source tooling? So for one client, we've got a multi-level tech stack, some Python, some Java. For the Python parts, we use SonarCube and Bandit. Um, for the Java parts and their mobile app deployments, we also use MobSF and SonarCube to examine that code. Um, a lot of people commit their bash scripts. So let's see if we could use things like shell check on here so that we can take an, uh, the time to analyze, okay, are there instances in the code base where you can get maybe command injection and onto the system or onto the server that's running this? So that's what you need to focus in on. You're building your tooling around your needs. Minimalism is important here. And nose reduction is also important. So if you've got, if you run uh, this suite of tools as an analyst and you've got maybe a hundred high level vulnerabilities, someone could be wrong. It could be the dev teams writing a secure tool, or it could be the tool that you're using that's generating a false positive. And we'll discuss the communication element and all of that stuff later on in the talk. But context is really important here. Another way that tooling is really effective for is reducing waste and reducing duplicated effort. So, the, so do not waste your time trying to manually go through vulnerability management in detecting it. OWASP, we're talking about basic application security, 
like OWASP top 10, number nine, right? Don't use vulnerable components. And that sounds easy, sounds straightforward. It's like a best practice, everyone should do it. It's, it, it's not. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, it's going to be a hassle, it's gonna be difficult, but it's something that needs to be done. Um, I'll give you a brief examples, a few rants, if you will. The request package um, for uh, that's hosted on NPM is going to be deprecated, I think, February 11th. Uh, this is a foundational package for handling HTTP requests. Um, pretty much when Node was from the beginning of the NPM ecosystem, uh, request it, the request package has a long history. If you are running Node in your system, there's a chance are that you're using request or you're using a dependency somewhere in your chain that also uses request. It's going into maintenance mode and then eventually won't receive updates. So if you're trying to deploy a web app on Node, uh, using create a web app using Node, that you need to look at your software supply chain. You've got to make the updates and configurations and look in your supply and you're looking into the dependencies you have. And we'll cover that in another demo. Another free, another freebie and rant. If you are running Python in your Java code, uh, chances are you're using the JSON library, which runs on Python 2.x. That is end of life. It's end of life. They actually started enforcing it this year, but it's been end of life for about a decade <laughs> and you're running end of life software. There are no patches for this. So you've got to really dive into the architecture for some of these projects. Start from the beginning. Don't create new, so don't create new software or create new projects from end of life and deprecated hey, code. You got to start that from the beginning. Now, we're going to do a brief demo, and this is going to cover the workflow for an analyst. This is for security teams. This is for that one security champion that you've got already embedded into your DevOps, uh, for your DevOps team, um, or it's consult a third-party consultant you call for the job. You're going to be standing up a VM. We're going to be standing up a VM. Uh, it's called Static Analysis TTP. That is publicly available, and it launched about a couple hours ago. Um, huge credit, huge thank you to Al Alex uh, Rodriguez, for my coworker, for helping set this up. It's made my life so much easier, and I'm going to demonstrate how we go to use it today. So, tab, tab, tab. We're just going to hop in. So before I'm going to assume that you all know how to clone a project, get clone, whatever, and that you've already got it on the machine. One thing that we're going to need to focus on is the main configuration file. Since this uses Vagrant, we're going to just vim the Vagrant file. Now, the one line, uh, the one line that's going to be really important to be this line. In this case, I've already got the VM set up to a directory on, to a directory on my system. I'm only double escaping these slashes because I'm on a Windows box and that's just what uh, we have to do. It's going to mount it into this client code folder. So we're opening up the host, uh, just one folder on the host file system and make it available to our guest VM. And we do handle that with the configuration line. By the way, everything I'm going to talk about is already embedded in the README. But if TLDR, you didn't read, um, you can hop in and listen to the recording with this later. So now that we've got the basic configuration and everything set up, we just do Vagrant up. And from there, we're going to just give it some time and load. And while we're doing that, just go into brief, uh, brief introduction for how we're going to do this. Next steps we're going to use is we're also going to use Vagrant 
to provision our different tools. Now this is based, now the provisioning for this VM is going to be using it. Uh, it's going to be using Ansible, Ansible playbooks. And so we've got it set up so that for based on the tool. So if you want to provision with Sonar Cube, you throw up uh, Sonar, a vagrant provision with Sonar Cube, but you can actually work on your workflow and get it automated to the point where if you know a certain project or a certain client, you can do vagrant provision and then that client name and then automatically get all run the playbook for all of the tools. So a lot of the, so Shellcheck, MobSF, Bandit, those already come included or are already alive in the repo. And we're getting about done. From there, after we, after we provision everything, we're going to hop in, uh, hop into the box via SSH and then just run some analysis. And while we're finishing up, because this looks like it's going to be about done, I'm going to take a sip. Mainly because I'm at, mainly because I'm also out of coffee. And if this crashes and burns um, rather than sacrificing the chicken to the demo gods. I've got also a recorded version of this demo that's five minutes embedded in the slide deck. So if we have to go to it, we can. All right, that's done. Um, now we're going to provision the script. So I'm gonna cheat since I've already done this before <laughs> and just provision it with Sonar Cube. Um, Sonar Cube is the open source um, competitor to uh, Veracode. So there's a lot of general purpose tooling. We like to use it for Python, for Java, um, and also job, and do some additional JavaScript analysis that we can't get with other toolings, other tools. So let Ansible run the run its playbook, and then we'll be ready to start. While you're waiting for this um, and getting this to set up, this honestly takes minutes. You can also jump into the source code. You can jump into the client, uh, jump into the uh, client's code, and just start to go through, basically doing manual search for things like, okay, do we have hard do we have hard-coded credentials, all right? Do we use insecure random number generators for the cryptography libraries, um, so on and so forth. So while you're getting things set up, you, you can just have your hands always moving, always doing, always doing something. And we're done. So Vagrant SSH, we hop into the box, and we're going to highlight and keep track of this IP address as this is really important. It's going to, we're going to be navigating to the instance of Sonar Cube uh, on a port that's on that IP address. Um, and from our host machine, we'll be running the analysis and we'll be looking at the analysis and the whole dashboard of everything created from there. All right. When Ansible runs its playbook, you get, um, it already comes with commands and scripts already included. So in this case, we've got Sonar Cube, we're going to do Sonar Cube create, and that will create our Sonar Cube instance. And we're also going to do Sonar Cube start. Now, there is also another command called sonar uh, SI sonar cube uh, monitor. If you've got Tmux or a screen session, you can make a new tab. You can make a new tab, I guess you call it, um, and have uh, actively monitoring the logs to see how the instance is running. This is going to be a brief demo, so we don't have to do any of that. 
So alt tab, alt tab, go to Chrome. And then and we're just going to hop in and log in via the browser. Awesome. So we're in Sonar Cube. Um, this is going to be a test instance that we do. So the password is admin admin. Uh, again, this is a local VM that's running on your machine. Um, and those are temporary credentials. But for the sake of argument, I'm going to generate, I'm going to publicly generate like 100, 100, 200 character password. It doesn't matter. I'm going to be new. I'm not going to save this because after this demo, I'm going to be nuking the VM anyway. So we're going to create a project. In this case, it's the static demo. Now you can call the, the token that it generates anything. In this case, I just have a human readable string called static demo. A starter for it. And this is going to be the initial project for it. We're going to hit generate. And then we're going to hit continue. The now you've got multiple languages that are available. Um, Maven and, Gr and Gradle are for are really for Java apps. .NET is for your running if you're running C sharp. Um, we're going to do other since we're the project that we're going to be examining is going to be a Python blog. And of course, Linux, because our guests, we're going to be running all of this in our guest VM, which is a Ubuntu box. Copy that over. Tab. Tab back to the terminal. And we're going to change directory to the client code. Not we configured in the vagrant file. That's where all these projects are going to be. Now, these are just open source projects that I pulled from GitHub. So I'm looking for, and you can run this to test it out as an example. We're just gonna, we're just gonna hop into Python, Python blog. And then within there, just run Sonar, then run SonarCube. And like, and like we were talking about before, a majority of your static analysis, uh, a stack analysis is going to be you taking the time not to, to either manually look for some things or go through the various findings that you find. Because these scans are not going to take that long at all. Um, and you don't have to worry about exploitation of the vulnerabilities you find, unless you're just the type of, you got enough information from your client, or you were able to stand up a version of the web app um, on your machine and then try to pen test it. So if you could squeeze, if you got extra time on your engagement and you, and you want to add some flavor uh, for your client, that's power to you. And we're done. So we're gonna hop, we're gonna hop back. We're gonna hop back to Sonar Cube. And now this is a general purpose tool that will help you with code smell and things like that, find areas in which there are bugs. But what we're really focusing in on is vulner vulnerabilities and security hotspots. So let's see what we got here. Well, we got a, we've got hard-coded credentials in the code base. And I don't know about you, but I call this high vulnerability. Now, you're going to have to be a proper analyst, dive into, the, dive into the source code, make sure that this isn't a unit test, um, make sure that this isn't just test code that isn't being shipped out. But from the looks of it, it looks like just credentials in plain text, especially and it's going to be used for the product, especially since they're going through the effort of hashing and salting it. So 
I count that as a high. So I'm going to do a brief skip in. Since the demo went well, we don't have to, we can skip over the video. We don't have to go over it. So that brings us to our second point. How do we fit this into the organization? How do we fit this in the AppSec program? Because the previous demonstration, we're not expecting the entire dev team to go manually through static analysis. They've got to push out code. They've got to meet their deadlines and, and get to the sprint. So how does this fit in to a global AppSec program? Um, the First part of it is actually it's not only is not only do you have the security team analyzing and looking at, at, at the products, also incentivize the engineers who are working on, on the product or the service to look at the code. Now, even the best AppSec and even the best AppSec engineers, even um, security people in general. There, there are going to be some missing spots that they're not going to catch. If you don't allow your engineers to actually take the time to look at the source code and incentivize to look at the source code and improve the, and improve the availability of the system, because that's ultimately what all of this ties to, you're running in functionally blind. There are things that the engineers are going to see that we are going to miss. And the example from here is awesome meme is like a designer. The spacing between letters is called, I think it's called kerneling. That's something a designer would see. Otherwise, who cares, you know? So let the engineers take a look at take a look at the product for security vulnerabilities, embed security champions within the dev team. Because with them, it's not going to be a checklist with them. They're going to find, they're going to have a deep understanding and be able to find things that you're not going to find immediately. Brief shout out to everyone who's doing the CTF and the Secure Coding Challenge. Godspeed to all of you. You are making AppSec better. Now we move on to automation. So let the engineers analyze. Now we move on to automation. And this beautiful SKCD describes the story of my life. Don't add any more automation than what is needed. It's okay if so initially some of the stuff is going to be manual, uh, it's going to be manual at first. You have to, you can only optimize after your workflow is functional. And each of the tools that we bring for the automation, we have to bring them in back, tying back earlier to that need. So we use CloudFormation to automate, to automate standing up cloud infrastructure. So we don't have, we don't have um, people hop, hopping in to the console or we don't have scripts tied in over have scripts and the SDK trying to stand up cloud infrastructure. The reason why we bring cloud formation in is so we automate and reduce the human error of that process. We know the task in which we're automating. And it's the same thing with these security checking checks that we are do, going to show you. I'm going to show you ways that you can do some linting on your CloudFormation templates and how to do some initial dependency checking with, uh, with code pipeline. The whole point of this automation is to actually take the process of automating the real task of, of examining your software supply chain, as it's called right now, and your dependencies for vulnerabilities. This is something any organization should do, man should do even if it has to be manually. We're just using tools to make this process a lot easier. And you also need to associate these sort of static analysis and the and these tools with feeding into the uh, CICD pipeline within the existing security process. 
as well as the existing de development cycles. So imagine, if you will, we're going through the traditional pen test for, uh, for cyclical methodology, where we do some reconnaissance uh, before we start the engagement, do some reconnaissance, see what we can find online, maybe find a few engineers and take them out to coffee, see what they will spill about the project. And then when we are on the engagement, the first thing we do is not trying to break things, not trying to hack it, but actually go through the happy paths, traverse it as a user, try to understand the application. Then from there, discover vulnerabilities and move on to uh, explo uh, exploitation of those vulnerabilities. Instead of imagine how much better the reconnaissance application mapping phase of this would go if you have all information, if pen testers have all information on the table, rather than having it a gray box or a black box engagement, have a full white boxing, a full white box engagement. That way, it may, that way you have an analyst looking in to the source code itself while you've got another team doing dynamic analysis or, pen or a formal penetration test. And then you can point out how this find how findings how the findings correlate to the actual source code and make remediation process a lot easier and quicker. So imagine how much smoother and how quickly we we can get at real actionable insights from our engagements if we add this this level of complexity if we glean all this useful information. And so that brings us to our demo. So this is going to be um, integrating some of these tools in an active CI CD pipeline. We're not gonna do it live. Uh, we're gonna do a video because I love you all. I love B-sides and I love everyone on this call, but I don't trust you. Um, having the call pre-recorded gives me a chance and opportunity to scrub uh, confidential information like ARNs and things like that. This isn't a uh, pre-reduction facing system in any way. It's in a stage environment, but I am paranoid um, as everyone else should be. So let's get started. So right now we're just in AWS Encode Pipeline. I noticed that uh, the build cycles failed. Let's hop into the logs and see what's going on. So from there, uh, we've got a build project, which is just a container that's already pre-provisioned for, um, that's already pre-provisioned from AWS. So we're going to run it. It's in this case, it could be it could be your own Docker container. It could be uh, Amazon Linux, or it could be a Ubuntu box. All of that's configurable either through CloudFormation or through the console. However, you want to do it. We dive through the log. We dive through the logs, and we see that we've done a Yarn audit. Now, what Yarn and NPM audit? Again. All they will do is just look at the existing de dependency trees found in the package.json and the package lock, and then see if some of those dependencies have previously disclosed vulnerabilities. So you're not looking for zero days here. You're looking for you know obvious patches that you're missing. So we continue on. We've got. This project is less than a month old. Um, yeah, pretty much. I think we started, uh, it'll be like 30, 33 days from when we started. And we've already got dependencies that do denial service, uh, cross-site scripting, and maybe some code execution or um, op prototype object, uh, proto object prototype poisoning. And it's resulted in two high, we get 44 vulnerabilities, two of those are highs. Now, I don't know about you, but my boss does not let me ship client side code with vulnerabilities in it. So the reason why we're putting in Yarn Audit into the pipeline is so that we stop the, the build process, maybe throw an alarm and alert 
So that way we get notified of, okay, there's some patching that needs to be done. Now, again, initially that can be done manually or you can provision, do some scripting on NPM audit fix to see if you can get um, your supply, those dependencies fixed before you launch. All right, and you also can use a tool called CFNAG. Now this does basic linting of your CloudFormation stacks to make sure that they fall Amazon um, best practices. Funny thing is we have, um, our project is being handled by Amplify. Uh, we're doing, doing Amplify to handle deployments and <laughs> Amazon tooling is generating these CloudFormation templates. And even then, um, CFNAG has find something to complain about of relatively untouched CloudFormation stacks. So it's one of those things where it's okay if you're not doing the cloud right. Um, <laughs> there's no perfect way, there's no perfect way to skin this cat. There are better things that improve overall operability, but don't be afraid don't be afraid that you're completely doing everything doing everything wrong unless you have an s3 bucket with like credit card data out in the open internet okay there's some standards there but there are many ways to skin the cat and your use case has to be dependent on your organization and what uh, sort of and what sort of projects that they're the reason why they're using the cloud. Oh, what was, where was I in the tangent? All right, CFNAG. <laughs> These screenshots are just of cloud formation templates. Some of them are warnings of general things. Sometimes you'll get some security issues is that all highlighted some helpful suggestions of how to set up logging and things like that. And so, although I've had it, I we have CEF and NAG already in our pipeline, we just couldn't get the video ready for the demo today. All right, almost done. This is the third and this is the third point. And this is a vision to you. And this is going to be a part where I, I step on the soapbox and, and say some basic truths about human interaction. Um, and communication and inoperability. And that's the true fact that our organizations like communication is deteriorated to the point where every time a thought leader walks page and points out that cooperation leads to better business outcomes. We hail them as the innovator of the 21st century. And you may ask, well, you're on the floor. You're, you're a speaker now. Um, what, are you, what, are, what is your response? What do you add to the discussion? And I'm like, dude, I'm 25. Like, I don't have the answers. I don't have this figured out. But you start making things better by being curious and by being and asking questions. And so before you even start this process of static analysis, before you even go in engagement with a client, here are some questions that you need to ask before. One, what is this app supposed to do? Why is the business and why is the organization spending time, money, energy, and effort into creating this product or service. What are the standard use cases? From there, and then from there, we're not trying to block the threat that is new tech and, that, and serverless web apps or, and things like that. The goal, our goal as um, security professionals and practitioners is to secure and to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and the availability of the system. And so it's not a threat that we're trying to eliminate. We're trying to actually, we're actually trying to get this thing launched and do it the right way. So start by genuinely asking questions and you're not trying to interview or grill people. You're just genuinely curious on what 
you can add to the process that will get this product launched and will make it more functional once it's in the public eye. You will get security compliance if there's genuine co collaboration in your organization. If you've got security teams, you've got operators and you've got developers and engineers working together, then PCI is not gonna be a problem. Now there are some check boxes and things that you gotta do, but if you have genuine cooperation between all of those parties and from how, and from the business standpoint, you can get the security compliance. Now you can get the security compliance if you've got that teamwork there. And now I don't bring static analysis as a way to create some holy war within your organization. These tools are not omniscient. They, some of them generate a lot of false positives, but it is a starting point. And the only way to weed out the false positives and get at the truth and the heart of what is what is to actually begin the discussion with all parties involved. This is what, um, this is, what it looks like. This is what DevOps, this is what Agile, and in manager and corp manager or corpro speak, this is what synergy is about. It's about genuine collaboration between the teams. You don't have to have these DevOps engineers that are that write sling code and spin up infrastructure unless your organization needs it. If you've just got an if you've got a dev team and an ops team that just communicate better and effectively, that equal that equal sign is they both result in a truth. They both boil down to something that's true and functional. And if you hire a bunch of rock stars, you're not you're just going to get a bunch of solos. You're not going to get a symphony in collaboration. So let's change the story that we had before. Let's flip the script on that and let's make the static analysis engagement a uh, better one. This case, instead of just, you know, sec people commiserating at the beginning, let's have it be a collaborative effort. Let's invite the engineers, let's invite engineers, people who are written, who've written code, production code into the kickoff meeting. And then once the once as security people, all as analyst, as um, consultants, we the tools we bring to the engagement are minimal, and are focused specifically on the organization's needs. Then, after that engagement is done, after we've created, a, after we created a deliverable, after we started the process. We then let the engineer, we then get, let the engineers analyze the product and the solution and try to see where that remediation process goes, where we can fit the tips and tricks in, because they're ultimately responsible for remediation in the first place. Then we can work on automation. And then once we have a figure out of what we can do, then we automate it and we associate it in the existing dev cycles and the existing security culture. And finally, when we're interacting with the people, when we're interacting with each other, we stay genuinely curious and we stay a collaborative because it's not just a one and done report. Um, I, I, one, of, uh, I, one of our clients is just, um, on a pen test, um, it was a follow-up report. And one of the things that was said was, okay, are we done with security now? Security is not just a one and done, but it's a journey. And it needs to be a journey with all the teams working, working harmoniously with one another. That's hopefully, uh, that's what I'm presenting to you. That's the vision that we can create together. Thank you for your time and attention. Stack analysis, put a shock to your system.
All right, thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions or anything? Well, it looks like in chat, I, somebody- I, oh. oh yeah, no, go, go ahead. ahead. If you see something in chat, go to that. And then I got to uh, 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 Somebody asked if this Vagrant stuff is, uh, is a project Alex set up or is that on GitHub? Uh, both. It is a project that Alex set up and it is available on GitHub. Um, the links like the link to it is in the slide notes and it's um, static analysis TTP. It launched today. So that is publicly available. We accept PRs. There's an, there's an open bug while I was working on the uh, demo at two in the morning. <laughs> so we accept PRs. We accept PRs and it's put freely available for the use. The URL to the project. Let's see if I have it in my clipboard. I can drop it in chat. Static analysis TTP. Actually, I have it in why am I doing this? I have it in one of the in a window. Right there. And yep. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry, I was, I, I muted and started talking. <laughs> so I'm I'm a I'm a pretty I'm a pretty big Sonar Cube fan. I like it. Um, the uh i get mixed reactions though when i go outside of like my small group of other fans uh people who they they, they want to the downplay its security benefits right and upplay its quality benefits and i try to tell people that i like the message that sends the developers um that it's bugs first or however how i phrase it but in, in your experience or the people you talk to, what's kind of the reaction to that particular tool? Um, I mean, I like it, I'm a fan. I just wanted to sort of commiserate a little and hear what you had to say there. So um, the, I get what you, I, I, get, I get what you're saying for. Um, when, when we're doing an engagement, when we're doing the stack analysis engagement, SonarCube isn't the only tool that we're running. We're doing, in our process, we were running multiple tools. We actually spend the time uh, also follow up, try to figure out, eliminate the false positives. And we, we generate, when we work on the reporting and the deliverable, we're not slapping the, we're not slapping like the uh, results of Sonar Cube immediately to the client. What we're generally doing is we filter is just the the aggregate of all of the tools. The aggregate of um, all of the tooling. So, okay. one thing that I have to say, if we're doing a Sosta thing, if we're on, if we're working with uh, a dev team more directly, is allow that and keep going with that theme. Um, keep going with the uh, keep. Focus in on bugs first, because all security vulnerability is is a bu is a bug that compromises the CIA triad of a given right. app. Yeah. So start as in, and start with us. Uh, keep continuing on with that. Um, don't let then part of that has to be done at the top level. Um, like again static analysis tools aren't perfect there are going to be some configurations um because the there are going to be devs that just write dot code and then there are going to be tools that are way too hypersensitive so that discussion i don't have an easy answer of how yeah, to yeah 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 how, how, how to eliminate the discussion you know i think um to... i think part of it is our different perspectives right i'm i'm in a place where it's the same group of dev teams, right? We're, we're building like two or three products and I'm bringing that to them as part of their pipeline. 
I'm not, it's like, um, I could definitely see the benefit of, hey, I'm doing an engagement and you want us to take a look at your code. I've got this great tool and that allows you to present it as the part of the whole, which is nice. So that would make sense. That's why it's a little different for me. Um, I get some mixed reactions with it. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. And I like how it uh, integrates, uh, generally integrates with most of your uh, code repository systems, right? So you do a pull request and you can have the result in the pull request. And it's yep. like, okay, there's this is tool that runs and here's a pull request. And if you want to go forward, um, address this. And at least someone's got to recognize it. So stuff like that, it's pretty cool. Try, um, what I would say is, I know it has to try to frame it, try to work with uh, product owners, people who have uh -huh. uh, the stake in the building the requirements and build that into, build that into the requirements of the product. Because one thing that you will find, and this is, is going to be create a lot of friction, um, shift left a little further past the dev team. Because when you get to the point where you're in a position where you're blocking the launch, you become an obstacle. They try to backflip and they'll try to move around. They have to. The, that's the whole point of being agile is to try to streamline it and get it as fast as possible. And I don't know... I, your organization is your organization. I don't know how that we would have to get on a call and do an engage uh, engagement and, and like do a full arc, arc review to figure out what's what and where it's going on. But actually when the product is made, have those like security things that auth what does the authorization uh, authentication look like? from the beginning, the requirements presented to the engineers. And then it's not a security checkbox thing before launch. It is, hey, this is just part of the sprint. This is part of the requirements that were already in the user story. The user story is we've got MFA, we, you, you have MFA as a feature. Nice. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for expanding on that. I, I really liked your perspective. Like there's, uh, I'll, I'm gonna do some of that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any questions? Go ahead. I'm gonna go do. Oh uh, yeah, I had a quick question. That out. URL doesn't seem to work. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, if you go to the professionally evil site. It's not one of the things listed. Yeah. Okay. If you lop the static analysis TTP off the end, it's not on that page. <sighs> Yeah, give uh, me give, give me a, me a second. second. <laughs> I thought uh hey, it's brand new. Stuff happens. It's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> check it now to <laughs> see if it's launched. It was for, we we had a private we had a, a as oh, a yeah. private repo. Yeah, so They're you got private. it on private. Yep. We're, we're sweet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, happy to help. Thanks for making this stuff available. Yeah, no. Um uh, thank uh, thank y'all for having me. A any more questions? All right. Well, thank you for speaking. Uh, there is the.